It is time for question period. The Leader of Her Majesty's Loyal Opposition. Thank you and uh, good morning, uh, Speaker. And my question is for the Premier. In the, this, the last question period of the 41st Parliament, we would be remiss not to summarize the last few years of Liberal rule. Premier Kathleen Wynne was, will desperately try to change the channel, but this election campaign, the Liberals will have to defend 15 years of waste, scandal and mismanagement. Uh, obviously, the skyrocketing hydro rates are first and foremost. Compared to 2003, the average family now pays over $1,000 more per year on their hydro bill. Ontario is now home to among the highest electricity rates in all of North America. Speaker, will the Premier remember that families across the province are being forced to choose whether to heat or eat while Liberal insiders have gotten rich at their expense? Here, here, here. Well, thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. And just let me say to the uh, to the member opposite, I want to congratulate him on the job that he's done as the leader in the House and to wish him well in his next uh, steps, but he won't be in this job, and I just want to say that you've done a great job. I don't always like your questions, but you've done a great job. <laughs> Uh, Mr. Speaker, and I, you know, I, uh, I want to just say that full-day kindergarten, roads and bridges and transit being built all over the province, an unemployment level that is the lowest that it's been in nearly 20 years, Mr. Speaker, uh, the fact that there are 235,000 young people who are in college or university tuition-free because of the changes that the fact is, Mr. Speaker, that Ontario is doing well, and we want to make sure that Ontario continues to do well. We need to invest in the people of this province Answer. because investment in people means that the province is stronger and the economy flourishes. Thank you. Mr. Speaker. You seated, please. You seated, please. Thank you. Supplementary. Back to the Premier. Uh, thank you for your comments, Premier. However, as I continue, Ontario will never forget the gas plant scandal. Uh, this cost Ontario taxpayers a whopping $1.1 billion. Stop. 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 <clears throat> We're in warnings. Then I'll use them. Please finish. Speaker, a senior Liberal operative was handed a jail sentence for deleting emails and destroying evidence. Kathleen Wynne was the co-chair of the 2011 Liberal election campaign when the decision to cancel these gas plants was made. Kathleen Wynne personally signed the Cabinet documents that gave up Ontario's legal defences, choosing instead to deal secretly with the companies. That was a key, Speaker, and one of Premier Kathleen Wynne's first decisions after the 2014 election was to cancel the committee that was so close to getting answers for Ontario Question. families. Mr. Speaker, does the Premier acknowledge that the gas plant scandal will remain a big part of her legacy? Thank you. Attorney General. General. Well, Speaker, uh, this Premier ran for office on the promise to ensure that there is secure retirement for hardworking Ontarians. She accomplished that. This Premier Speaker ran on the promise to fight climate change. She has accomplished that. This Premier Speaker ran on the promise of investing in our infrastructure across this province, building roads and bridges and public transit in all four corners of that province. She has accomplished that. Right. Speaker, this is a Premier who has put Ontarians first. This is a Premier who has invested in things to ensure that all Ontarians of all backgrounds have the equality of opportunity to succeed, whether they're Indigenous, whether they are racialized, whether they come from urban areas or the rural areas. This Premier has made sure that Ontarians come first, and she will continue to do that job for the people of Ontario. Final supplementary. To the Premier. The Premier tells us that she got into politics for, to fight for education, but her government has closed more schools than any other government in our province's history. The Premier sold off Hydro One in what families call. Okay. 
Minister of Advanced Education is warned. And there's plenty more trying. Finish, please. The Premier sold off Hydro One in a fire sale. The Premier put the interest of her insider friends above the interests of the people of Ontario. The Premier has defended a $6 million salary at Hydro One while families decide whether to heat or eat. The Premier has watched hundreds of thousands of manufacturing jobs leave our promise. And the Premier has slashed health care, stood idle as hallway health care crisis developed Question. under her watch. Mr. Speaker, when did the Premier lose her way? Oh. Speaker, this is coming from a party that has that is running on the platform of cuts, cuts, and cuts. They are going to cut minimum wage for hard-working people. Doug Ford is going to cut corporate taxes for the wealthy uh, companies in uh, in our province. The member from Stormont Dundas South Bend, Gary, is warned. And what else Doug Ford's going to do, Speaker? He's going to cut jobs of hard-working Ontarians like our teachers and personal support workers and nurses for finding his so-called efficiencies. What this Premier has done, that she has raised minimum wage to $15 an hour citing January 1st, 2019 for hard-working Ontarians. She had ensured that drugs Sir. are free for children and youth to the age of 25 and should be free for our seniors. She had made sure that besides full-day kindergarten that we have free childcare Thank for you. our kids in preschool. Thank you. New question. The Leader of the Opposition. Uh, my question is for the Premier. For 15 years, the Premier has ignored the mantra of care, not cuts. Always choosing cuts over care. Liberal cuts have created a hallway health care crisis in Ontario. We now have the longest wait times in Ontario's history. The Liberals have fired more than 1,600 nurses. The Liberals have cut physiotherapy services for seniors. The Liberals have frozen hospital budgets. The Liberals have slashed physician services and cut medical residency positions. Mr. Speaker, over the noise, why has the Premier left a hallway health care crisis in Ontario? Thank you. Minister of Health and Long-Term Care. Minister of Health and Long-Term Care. Well, thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. And of course, on this side of the House, we are extremely proud of our record when it yeah, comes to well. health care. Because over the past decade, Ontario's health care system has improved significantly. We've increased our investments in health care each and every year, allowing us to treat more patients, provide better care, and reduce wait times to some of the shortest in the country. More than a million more Ontarians and 94 per cent of all Ontarians now have access to a primary care provider, one of our early initiatives in our mandate. Uh, both the Fraser Institute, I would hope that the members opposite uh, would appreciate their analysis. Both the Fraser Institute and the Wait Time Alliance have consistently ranked Ontario as having the best median wait times in Canada, a direct result of all the investments that we have made. Answer. And so, uh, through the uh, successive years, we've made considerable investments. I'll have more to say in the Thank supplementary. Thank you. Thank you. Supplementary. Back to the Premier. With crisis on top of crisis, the Premier has left Ontario in a dangerous financial position. Over the last 15 years, Ontario's, Ontario's debt has more than tripled, all to help pay for Liberals' waste, mismanagement and scandals. Ontario taxpayers now pay a billion dollar a month on interest payments. This crowds out all the services families depend on, like health care and education. Speaker, this is exactly what the Auditor General warned us in 2015 and 2016 that would happen. So, Mr. Speaker, does the Premier realize her billions of dollars of waste, mismanagement, and scandal have crowded out frontline health care and hurt families? Thank you. Minister? For finance. Mr. Speaker, I, um, I take the question with some interest, and uh, I think it's all part of the Fidelity's uh, newest fantasy book about finance. The member will use members. Uh, the member will use members' writings or their title, please. 
Okay, the member uh, from North Bay's fantasy book, uh, talking about uh, interest on debt just now. This member should know that here in Ontario, we have the lowest interest on debt in 25 years at eight cents of every dollar. When they were in power, it was at 15 to 16 cents, Mr. Speaker. And talking about crowding out programs, their programs, that what they're proposing now, is up to 16 billions in cuts that will crowd out and cut those programs entirely, Mr. Speaker. We're investing in our economy. We're investing in our programs and services. We are leading Canada. We have the lowest unemployment in two decades. And, Mr. Speaker, we know more needs to be done, and it's not by Thank making you. those cuts. Thank you, Mr. Thank you. Speaker. Final supplementary. Well, uh, Speaker, for my final time to stand in this legislature, I'll go back to the Premier. We have seen the harm the Liberals have inflicted on the people of Ontario over the last 15 years. But only Doug Ford and the Ontario PCs have a plan for the people of Ontario. We will put more money in the pockets of, of we will put more money in people's pockets. We will clean up the hydro mess. We will create good jobs. We will restore responsibility, accountability, and trust. And we will cut hospital wait times. Mr. Speaker, the people of Ontario need to know help is on the way. Thank you. Minister. So, Mr. Speaker, here's what they're going to help us do, and what are you going to do to this province? He's already saying he's going to cut revenues to the tune of two to three billion dollars. He's going to stop investing in those infrastructure projects that makes us competitive long term. Mr. Speaker, he's going to cut those programs, those health care and education programs that matter to people's lives. Mr. Speaker, he's going to harm people, put us in harm's way if he gets elected. More importantly and worse, Mr. Speaker, he's going to harm future generations by harming our economic growth. We need to stay steady. We need to continue to invest and continue to lead. Diversify our economy as what we are doing, Mr. Speaker, enabling us to weather those commodity shocks that may occur, and we have to be prepared for that. And Mr. Speaker, the member of the opposition and his leader are, are not taking the necessary steps to protect the people of this That's province. Right. This Premier is doing it. Our members on this side of the House are fighting every day for the people of Ontario, and will continue to do so going forward. Thank you. Be seated, please. Be seated, please. Thank you. New question, the leader of the third party. Thank you, Speaker. Speaker, before, uh, before, thank you. Uh, before I get to the first question, which is to the Premier, I just want to recognize that we're all heading out into the campaign trail over the next uh, number of weeks, and I'm looking forward to a very spirited but dignified debate on the future of this province and the 14 million people that call this beautiful province home. Democracy truly is a great thing when we debate each other with respect, so let's strive to deliver that kind of campaign to Ontarians because they deserve it, and it's something that we'll all be very proud of. So now to my question, Speaker. After 15 years in office, why does Ontario have hallway medicine, but we don't have pharmacare and we don't have dental care for everyone? Thank you. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker, and I know the Minister of Health and Long-Term Care is going to want to comment in the supplementary, but I want to just uh, thank the uh, leader of the third party, thank her for the debate last night, Mr. Speaker, and I agree with her completely that having a dignified debate uh, throughout the next 28, 29 days, Mr. Speaker, is good for the democratic, democratic process in Ontario, and I, I too look forward to that. And I want to just say to all of the members in the House that I wish them luck on the uh, campaign trail you know, to different degrees, some more than others. But, but personally, I wish you all uh, a good month ahead. Uh, Mr. Speaker, we have, as the Minister of Health and Long-Term Care has already said, we have invested in our health care system every single year. We have increased yes. investment, Mr. Speaker. We have worked to transform the system so that people who need home care have more home care in their homes where they want it, Mr. Speaker. You know, let's face it, more people want to stay Stay at home longer in Ontario, Mr. Speaker, and I think that goes Answer. across the country. We've made those investments, and we will continue to invest in the health care that people need when and where they need it. Thank you. Supplementary. 
Speaker, for 15 years, the Liberal government has had a choice. They could have continued with conservative cuts to hospitals and health care, or they could have made the investments needed to ensure that a growing and aging population had the health care that we need. We know what this Premier chose. Hospital patients are being treated in hallways, in lounges, even in bathrooms. Speaker. Why did this Premier choose to cut and not to care? Thank you. Minister of Health and Long Term Care. Minister of Health, Long Term Thank Care. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Well, later this morning, uh, the members of the third party are going to have a choice. Uh, they're going to have a choice to vote on our 2018 budget. Yeah. Yeah. I would have thought that this budget, as progressive as it is, is really uh, very much what they have been saying in this House they want to achieve. So I would urge them, of course, to vote with us because we think that our plan for health care is particularly well crafted. It's considering all the aspects, all the interconnecting links that relate to good health care and a good health care system. We, of course, have costed it out extremely carefully. We've looked at the uh, requirements with the gr uh, good advice of our local health integration uh, networks with the Ontario Hospital Association, the Home Care Ontario uh, group. Answer. We have an excellent plan for Ontario, and I urge the third party to support it. Thank you. Final supplementary. Well, don't hold your breath. <laughs> Uh, look, Speaker, if the Liberals wanted to end hallway medicine, they could have done that. If the Liberals wanted to bring in pharmacare and dental care for all, they could have done that for 15 years. Speaker, 15 years ago, they could have started down that path. But 15 years later, people are still going to an emergency room because they can't get the dental care that they needed. 15 years later, people are still forced to choose between paying for meds or paying for rent. Why are Ontario families still waiting for the health care that they deserve after 15 long years with the Liberals at the helm? Thank you. Minister? Well, as we've said repeatedly in this House, Mr. Speaker, of course, we've been investing each and every year. We've increased budgets for our hospitals and uh, for all the aspects uh, that connect uh, to the health care system. And so, as we look at the NDP platform, uh, we're glad that the NDP did replicate our $15 million investment in palliative care. Apparently, they are supportive of what we did last fall, opening some 1,200 new beds in our hospitals this winter. Winter, but I think we can be really disappointed when we look at the detail of their platform that they have not extended that surge capacity into the, this particular coming year, which of course we have committed to do because we know that there are capacity issues and we believe that new initiatives like our uh, reactivation care centres, such as the one at Humber, are extremely important. We're also Answer. quite disappointed to see that they would cut $500 million from what we have put forward for our extremely lot. important mental health and addictions Thank you. plan. Thank so you, Mr. Speaker. New question. The leader of the third party. Thank you, Speaker. My next question is also for the Premier. Fifteen years ago, Ontario voters rejected a Conservative government whose legacy was cuts in privatization. Fifteen years later, Ontario voters are about to reject a Liberal government whose legacy is even more cuts and even more privatization. Why did the Liberals spend 15 years cutting and privatizing when they could have delivered pharmacare and dental care for everyone? So, Mr. Speaker, uh, let's, just, let's just put the facts on the table. The fact is that we have not been cutting health care. No. In fact, we have been investing every year, every year yeah. more yeah. money in, fun, in health care, Mr. Speaker. And, you know, I, I, just, I just need to make a comment because we are seeing an example today of where ideology gets in the way for the NDP. So, you know, the, the NDP doesn't believe in the private sector at all, doesn't think that no. business has a role to play, doesn't think that the private sector is of any use at all, which is a bizarre concept, but that seems to be what they believe. Today what we're seeing, Mr. Speaker, is the ideology around labour relations is preventing the NDP from voting to have the kids at York back in right. their classrooms, Mr. Speaker. Ideology does not solve problems, Mr. Speaker. We solve problems practically on this side of the House, and ideology gets in the way of the best interests of people. In this Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Supplementary. 
Well, Speaker, 10 long weeks later and right before an election, it's no wonder this Premier once again is looking after her own political interest than she is those 10 weeks ago that she should have been dealing with those kids. But look, I am very proud of my value, Speaker, and what this Premier can be sure Stop, Club. You may not like it, but my resolve goes right until it's finished. Please finish. This Premier and the people of Ontario can be sure of that my values are the same before an election, during, ele during an election, and after an election. Not like the Liberals, Speaker. Not like the Liberals. A government can get a lot done in 15 years. If they wanted, the Liberals could have ended hallway medicine and delivered pharmacare and dental care if they wanted. But for 15 years, that's not what Liberals wanted. They wanted to cut and they wanted to privatize. They wanted to help their Bay Street friends and campaign donors while making life harder for everyone else. For 15 years, why didn't the Liberals want to end hallway medicine and Question. deliver pharmacare and dental care for everyone? Well, Mr. Speaker, you know, uh, it's interesting. Um, my values have nothing to do with elections. Yeah. My values actually have been in place my whole life, Mr. Speaker. And I would say to the member, I would say to the leader of the third party, if I look at her 2014 platform, her values seem to have changed because, Mr. Speaker, about today is a request to the NDP to get the York students back into here, their here. classrooms, get the ideology out of the way. You see that, please? You see that, please? The Minister of Infrastructure is warned. And another minister was on my list, but he beat you to it. Final supplementary. Well, Speaker, 15 years is enough time for a government to fund colleges and universities properly so there's not labour strife every couple of years. 15 years is enough time for a government to make sure that Ontarians can get the take-home cancer drugs that they need or a child's toothache treated without worrying about how to pay for it, Speaker. After 15 years, haven't Ontario, Ontario families waited long enough for pharmacare and dental care for all? Thank you. Premier. Minister of Health and Long-Term Care. Minister of Health, Long-Term Care. Well, Mr. Speaker, I think we need to be a little bit objective here for a moment. Ontarians are living longer, healthier lives than almost anywhere else in the world. Yeah. And any opposition party that suggests our system is in crisis is fear-mongering for political gain. Yes. Our health care system and health care professionals are stepping up and meeting the needs of increasingly complex care cases with increasing volumes every year. Year. And to suggest they're not meeting that challenge in outcomes is a disservice to all the people who work in our health care system each yeah. and every day. Disrespectful. This mandate that we have had has recognized uh, that we need to go beyond keeping people alive to experience an, uh, a health care system that puts patients first. This is what we have done, Answer. and we cannot uh, afford to uh, lambaste our health care system in the way that the NDP are doing. It is inaccurate, and it does a great disservice to Thank all you. the hard-working yeah. health care professionals. New question, the member from York Simple. Today, I rise to my last question of this government. Premier, as I rise today, I can't help but think about legacy. What will, be the, what will be the legacy that I leave behind in my riding of York Simcoe? What will the legacy be of this government? I hope that my legacy will be one of representing my riding to the best of my abilities and of standing up to, uh, or for our local environment. When I think of this government and its legacy, I think of skyrocketing hydro rates, cancelled gas plants, cuts to frontline health care, 
school closures and broken promise after broken promise. I think of the financial policies that care more about photo ops than they really Christian. do change. Premier, my question today is simple. Given your track record, can people believe any promise that you will make once the writ drops? Thank you. Well, thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. And I just want to say to the honourable member, she has served her constituency well. She is a fine woman. And, and I, I know, I know that she has worked That's hard nice. for a stronger Ontario. I don't actually believe that uh, that the member opposite really wants to see this province cut. I don't think she wants to see education and health care cut. She lived through that in another government, and she's, she knew that there, were, there was damage done in, uh, in her community, Mr. Speaker, and I believe that she has the best interests of the people of Ontario at heart. So, Mr. Speaker, I wish her well. I thank her for her service, and you know, uh, I hope that as we, as we continue to build the province, she will see the benefits in her riding. Thank you. Yes, thank you, uh, Mr. Speaker. Premier, under your leadership, taxes and fees have only increased. Billions of dollars have been wasted, and Liberal insiders have become rich, all at the expense of hardworking Ontarians. In my 23 years, I have never seen hallway spaces assigned as if they were actual beds in a, hotel, in a hospital. Now you are trying to hoodwink yeah. voters with their own money. Photo op finance is not the answer. Responsible government is. Here, here. Yeah. I would begin to list the election promises that you have failed to keep, but I'm afraid the speaker would cut me off. <laughs> Premier, I will ask again, given your track record, how can Question. voters trust any promise that you will make? Thank you. Premier. You know, Mr. Speaker, um, I know that those are the party lines that the yeah. member opposite is reading, Mr. Yeah. Speaker. Yeah. And I also know because I, my, I have a sister and uh, a brother-in-law and uh, three nieces and a nephew who live in the, the member's riding, Mr. Speaker, in Bradford. And Mr. Speaker, I, I have seen the great schools that they have gone to, Mr. Speaker. Yep. Yep. I have seen Bradford wow. growing and yep. thriving, yep. Mr. Speaker. It is a going concern. It's changed enormously over the last 10 years, Mr. Speaker. The green belt uh, is part of the uh, environment there, Mr. Speaker. So, you know, really Bradford and the riding that the member represents is part of the success story that is Ontario, Mr. Speaker. We're seeing, we're seeing people moving to Ontario. We're seeing businesses come to Ontario, which is why our unemployment rate, Mr. Speaker, is the lowest it's been in nearly 20 years. So, Mr. Speaker, again, I thank the member opposite for all the work she's done in her community, and we know the community will continue. Thank you. New question, the member from Toronto, Danforth. Thank you, Speaker. Speaker, my question to the Minister of Community and Social Services. Carol Ratzlaff and her husband have a son, Sam, with a substantial developmental disability. This family applied for passport funding over three years ago, as recommended by ministry staff, to ensure it would be available once Sam graduated from school. He'll graduate in June. 18 months ago, they made contact with the local church to secure a part-time job for Sam so he'd have structured activities during the day. In March, the family tried to confirm from the ministry that the passport funding would be in place for Sam's graduation. What they received were vague answers and no guarantee that the funding would be in place. To the minister, why are families like this being abandoned by your ministry when the need is so Washington. profound? Thank you. Minister of Community Social Services. Well, thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. And um, a little advice for the member opposite. When he has specific issues like this that relate to people in his community, the best thing to do is just to come over and talk to me about it because we can work on that specific case and get some help. But he knows uh, better than anyone in this House that I cannot speak to that specific issue in this forum. But I would 
be happy to speak to you about this at any any time. Um, Mr. Speaker, uh, we want to make sure that um, everyone in the province of, uh, of Ontario uh, can uh, move uh, forward with success, and of course that includes uh, people uh, that have developmental uh, disabilities. And that's why, Mr. Speaker, in our 2018 budget, uh, which uh, we'll vote on today, uh, it includes making sure that every single person in Ontario that qualifies will receive passport funding. And I hope the member uh, supports the budget so he can support uh, this Answer. particular family and people in his community. Well, that's not what the ministry staff told the family. My office contacted the ministry staff about this family. We got this response. The parents were encouraged to continue to work with Developmental Services Ontario and the program supervisor also explained that there are fee-for-service options available for the individual. The parents cannot afford to pay for services. That's why they've applied for funding. Sam will be forced to stay home and do nothing during the day, although his parents planned ahead of time and they followed ministry instructions. Why is it the families in crisis who follow your instructions still find themselves without help and directed to private services? Thank you, Minister. Mr. Speaker, in our budget, uh, we're going to invest $1.8 billion over the next three years for developmental services. Mr. Speaker, this is the first time in the history of this province that every eligible adult with developmental disability, including uh, youth turning 18 and transitioning to adult services, will get at least $5,000 per year of direct funding through the passport system. This means that uh, Mr. Speaker, over 42,000 more people will be brought into the system by 20, uh, 20, uh, sorry, 2020 and 2021. Um, Mr. Speaker, we want to make sure that um, regardless of where you live in the province and uh, regardless of your ability, that you have support services in place where you can actually uh, uh, receive some type of funding uh, so you can uh, use it uh, for uh, services that you need. Answer. Thank you. New question. The member from Davenport. Thank you, Speaker. And my question this morning is for the Minister of Seniors Affairs. Speaker, my riding of Davenport is home to a large number of seniors, and as I'm and I'm sure you know, seniors make up the fastest growing segment of Ontario's population. Today, there are more than two million seniors in our province, and that number is expected to double to over four million in the next 25 years. That is why it is especially important we have a government that is making investments in care that will ensure seniors across the province have the supports they need for whatever their needs may be. And I'm so proud that our government has continued to make historic investments that will support seniors at all stages of their life to ensure they are living active, engaged, and socially connected lives. Mr. Mr. Speaker, just last November, our government reaffirmed its commitment to Ontario seniors when we announced Aging with Confidence Ontario's Action Plan for Seniors. Question. This wide-ranging plan contained $155 million in programs. Speaker, would the Minister of Seniors Affairs explain to this House about these crucial investments in care that will Thank benefit you. Ontario Great. seniors? Minister of seniors Affairs. Thank you, Speaker, and I want to begin by thanking the member from Davenport for that excellent question, and I know personally her advocacy for seniors in her riding. As she mentioned last November, Mr. Speaker, our government announced Aging with Confidence, and part of that plan, Mr. Speaker, was 30,000 new long-term care beds, including 5,000 over the next four years. And I just want to say, Mr. Speaker, we've made good on that first phase of 5,000 licenses have been issued, including two in my own riding in my own city of Mississauga, and something really historic, Mr. Speaker, for the very first time, licenses have been given for a South Asian long-term care home. That's really, really important for our community. Mr. Speaker, but we know that, you know, our today seniors want us to look at, look at them not just through the lens Answer. of health care, and I will have more to say on that in the supplementary. Thank you. Supplementary. So thank you, Minister, for reiterating this to, uh, to this House, the priority that this government places on providing uh, care for our seniors. And I, too, am pleased to uh, have uh, announced along our Minister of Finance that for the first time, uh, 256 licenses were given to the Portuguese-speaking community. Yeah. 
and we are all pleased to know that this side of the House recognizes seniors as far more than just a health care expense. Instead, this government knows that while some seniors require the constant care and support of a long-term care home, others want to remain living independent and in their own homes for as long as possible. That is why it is so important for government to make the critical investments in care that provide seniors with the supports they need so they can choose to remain in their own homes for longer. Can the Minister of Seniors Affairs please inform this House of how this government's committed, continued investments Question. in care will impact the seniors in my riding of Davenport and across this province? Thank you, Minister. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. As you know, today we are going to be voting on our budget, and everybody in this legislature has the opportunity to support Ontario seniors today. Because in our budget, Mr. Speaker, we have a number of initiatives that support seniors, including the $750 annually for seniors 75 years or older, which will help seniors live independently in their own homes. And, Mr. Speaker, we are also expanding OHIP Plus to those over the age of 65. So I. I urge everybody in this House, if you want to support Ontario seniors, today's the day. Vote for the budget. Thank you. New question. question. The member from Nickelbelt. Thank you, Speaker. My question is for the Minister of Health. For a very long time, long-term care homes in northeastern Ontario have been facing a severe shortage of personal support workers better known as PSWs. The situation has created hardship for long-term care homes, their workers, their residents and family. But Northerners are resilient, Speaker. The leadership at St. Joseph Health Centre found a possible way forward in collaboration with Collège Boreal. They are offering free tuition and free education and free paid hours to people who hold diploma in non-registered RN or RPN developmental support workers, rehab physio and occupational therapy assistant, as well as paramedics, to become qualified PSW. Minister, will you Question. support this pilot project? Thank you. Minister of Health, Long-Term well, Care. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. And certainly we do value our PSWs uh, 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 as an integral part of the health care team. And uh, this is precisely why we're, over the next three years, investing some $23 million to add 5,500 PSWs to the workforce in underserviced communities. And we're also providing $38 million for training uh, and education for new and existing PSWs to ensure that they have the tools they require to support our loved ones. And so we have, in fact, committed to $65 million over three years as a retirement security in PSWs as well. And specifically, we are working uh, uh, in uh, the north with St. Joseph's uh, to support them. Uh, this is an interesting initiative, uh, and uh, I look forward to hearing more uh, from the member opposite. Okay, Minister, the shortage of PSW in the Northeast Lynn is not new, but it is severe. St. Joseph Health Centre told you about their struggle and requested support from your government. How did your government respond? Well, your government gave the home a compliance order for being short PSW. Really, Speaker, a compliance order? How does that help the residents of the long-term care home in northeastern Ontario? How does that help the North recruit and retain more PSW? St. Joseph Health Centre has a possible solution, a creative pilot project developed in the North, but that could help the shortage of PSW throughout our province. This proposal is sitting on your desk, Minister. Will you sign it today? Thank you, Minister. I would like to uh, remind the member opposite, Mr. Speaker, that in 2015 we increased wages for PSWs to recognize the important role that they play, and I believe the member opposite voted against that. Um, so, of course, we're very aware of the need to recruit and retain, keep uh, PSWs uh, in the system for the valuable work that they do. We're going to continue to work with St. Joseph's. Uh, this is an interesting project. There is a um, uh, a career pathway that is being proposed, and uh, this is certainly that uh, uh, is very worthy of consideration. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Thank you. Your question, the member from Kitchener, Conestoga. Yes, uh, well, thank you, Speaker. Um, I want to first 
first off say it's been a privilege and honour, of course, to represent uh, my constituents of Kitchener, uh, Conestoga, and of course to work with all of you for the last uh, six and a half years. Speaker, my question is to the Premier, of course, on a topic that I've raised many times in this House, fair and open tendering for construction projects. In the region of Waterloo, nearly 84 per cent of construction firms and the skilled tradespeople they employ have been prevented from working on local infrastructure projects because of a loophole in Ontario Labour Relations Act. Speaker, this isn't fair for taxpayers or local construction workers who should have the right to work on publicly funded infrastructure in the community where they live, work and pay taxes. Premier, in the spirit of fairness, will you commit today to close this legislative loophole? Thank you, Premier. Minister of Labour. Minister of Labour. Thank you, Speaker, and thank you to the member for that question, Speaker. Um, the province of Ontario, as we know, has a very, uh, a very organized system and an organized system that works when it comes to uh, labour relations in the province of Ontario, Speaker. And what the uh, member refers to is provisions that typically prohibit employers in the province, throughout the province of Ontario, from contracting out work that's subject to their collective agreement to non-union contractors. It's been around, Speaker, for a long time. In fact, I believe it was bought in by the Conservative Party, if the member uh, remembers. Ontario's Labour, Rel uh, Labour Relations Act that we have in place right now it doesn't require such provisions. It doesn't prohibit such provisions either. Each time that a case comes forward, Speaker, the Labour Relations Board decides specifically okay. on the merits That's of that sir, case. Perfectly. Speaker, uh, if a municipality, any organization, feels it's wrongly God, bound, there is a way to apply for exclusion from this speaker. Supplementary. Yes, uh, thank you, uh, Speaker, and uh, back to the Premier. Premier, I know that uh, members of your government have had the opportunity to tour St. Mary's Hospital in Kitchener, which is also home to our leading regional cardiac care program. In fact, St. Mary's was one of three cardiac centers in Canada that recently performed better than the national average on all six cardiac quality indicators. Over the last few years, there have been a significant increase in the number of cardiac procedures performed at St. Mary's, which of course has put stress on the local hospital. As you know, the hospital has long waited for the promised EP lab and now requires additional investment to meet our community's health care needs. Will the Premier commit today to providing the needed investment to expand the world-class quality care cardiac program at St. Mary's Hospital in Kitchener? Because the Minister of Health. Minister of Health. Well, thank you very much, Mr. Speaker, and I'd like to say to the member opposite, uh, I know he's recently had some corneal transplant surgery, and I, I wish you very well with your recovery and in the future. And uh, I want to ensure the member that our government has made it clear that we have approved this particular project. Uh, we uh, know the member has been an advocate for this particular project, as has our member from Kitchener Centre. And uh, back in 2016, actually, we put this project as part of our budget, and it was approved at that particular time. I can understand why the member opposite is anxious about this uh, project, because should uh, his leader potentially become the Premier, we know that there are going to have to be cuts, and I would expect that this one might very well be one of those cuts that uh, the leader Sir. of the uh, official opposition might put in place. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Thank you. Your question, the member from Beaches, East York. Well, thank you, Speaker. My question is to the Minister of Economic Development and Growth. Now, Speaker, our government has a long track record of standing up for the auto sector and its workers. We all know that during the recession, the sector was hit especially hard, and we needed to make a bold decision. Do we stand up for the auto sector, make strategic business investments, or stand back and do nothing? Unlike the Conservative Speaker, who would have allowed the industry to collapse, we stood up for the auto sector. And since 2004, the Ontario government has invested $1.56 billion in the auto sector, leveraging $12.2 billion in private investments, creating and retaining over 90,000 jobs. And these investments not only secured auto plants in General Motors, Chrysler and Windsor, and Brampton and Oakville, they also ensured our supply chain remains strong and vibrant in Ontario. So, Speaker, the opposition has regularly made it clear that they do not stand Question. up for the auto sector. They call it corporate welfare, and Doug Ford says he's getting rid of it. So, Minister, please tell us, the House, about our latest investments in the auto sector. Minister of Economic Development and Growth. Thank you very much, uh, Speaker. I want to begin, of course, by thanking the member for Beaches East York for his question and for his advocacy for his community. 
Uh, speaker, the member is 100 per cent right. We have just made as a government a further investment in the auto sector, securing our auto footprint for years to come. Last Friday in Cambridge, the Premier and the Minister of Transportation announced our renewed partnership with Toyota wow. to ensure the long-term competitiveness of the Cambridge and Woodstock plants. Our government's investing $110 million through the Jobs and Prosperity Fund, which will help to secure 8,450 direct jobs. It has also helped to secure the manufacturing supply chain that supports these jobs. This landmark investment, coming at a time of uncertainty in the North American auto industry, makes the Cambridge and Woodstock plants highly competitive among Toyota's global operations. This investment will make Cambridge and Woodstock the only Answer. plants in North America building the RAV4 crossover, creating a RAV4 hub here in Ontario. This new investment is exactly the type of business support funding that our Conservative opponents have promised to cut. Thank you. Supplementary. This kind of investment is exactly what our Conservative opposition are cutting. And I want to thank the Minister for his answer. What a great announcement for the people of, of Ontario, specifically Cambridge and Woodstock. And it's important to hear about our investments in our workers and the businesses in these sectors. And that's a lot of people speak. Over 100,000 now are being employed in the auto sector in the communities across the province who depend on these jobs to feed their families, to pay for Little League hockey, to pay their mortgages and put away money for retirement. These are the jobs and the workers that the Conservatives were fined to be turned their backs on them when they refused to help the auto sector when they needed it most during the last recession. These are the jobs that Doug Ford Conservatives who would have no problem cutting when they eliminate the Jobs and Prosperity Fund and look for efficiencies. We all know what that means. Speaker, deep, deep cuts. So, Minister, Question. Speaker, will the minister tell us, please, how this new Toyota investment fits into our broader job strategy, how it differs from the opposition's thoughtless Thank strategy, and our Thank you, Minister. Thanks very much, Speaker. I thank the member from the, for the follow-up question. Our government has made strategic investments uh, and decisions to invest in our businesses and our people, and the result, Speaker, is that Ontario's economy is the strongest in the nation. Here, here. Together, working closely with the hardworking people and business owners of Ontario, our government has helped to create more than 800,000 net new jobs since the recession. In particular, we've created 40,000 manufacturing jobs, and last year alone created more than our competitors in the United States. Our unemployment rate is the lowest in 17 years and has been below the national average for 35 months straight. Our GDP growth continues to outpace Canada, the United States and Europe, and our business prosperity index is at a 20-year high. We are leading Canada in foreign direct investment, and our strategic jobs plan is to continue the success, continue to invest in the things that matter like the auto sector, securing investments like the one that we just announced last week Answer. in Toyota. And I want to pay tribute to the Premier, the member from Cambridge, and everybody in our government for this decision, for this investment, and for the success that Cambridge and Woodstock will have for years to come. Thanks. Your question, the member from here on Bruce. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. My question is for the Minister of Health and Long-Term Care. In 2011, the South Bruce Gray Health Centre in Concordia was promised $53 million in terms of redeveloping an emergency room. When the Liberal MPP at the time lost, that project was scrapped by this Liberal government. Now we are seeing the Concordia redevelopment project in this year's budget again. Minister, can you explain why the government used this year's budget to reannounce a project that was already promised to the Concordia community seven years ago? Thank you. Minister of Health, Long-Term Care. Well, thank you, Mr. Speaker. And I know the member for Huron-Bruce is uh, an advocate for her hospital. I uh, visited Concordia uh, uh, as Minister of Community and Social Services and uh, made a major announcement at the shelter in Concordia. Just part of what our government does, yes. of course, caring Lots for people. And I can understand her anxiety uh, in regard to this particular project. She has a, an opportunity uh, here this morning to vote for our budget, which will again include uh, the uh, investment that we feel that is needed in uh, Kin Cardin. Of course, we spend a considerable amount of time looking at projects, ensuring that they are a priority for us. We've made a number of investments across this province. 
province, and uh, we certainly intend to do the same in her community. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Thank you. Supplementary. Thank you very much, Speaker. And back to the minister. Everybody in the Concordian community knows why they're in the budget this year. It's a poison pill and proof point that this Liberal government doesn't care about rural Ontario frontline health care. They're just playing games. But Speaker, I do recognize the fact that this minister did come to visit the women's shelter, and we stood together, and she saw firsthand how much the community is growing and how badly we need that redevelopment project. So I asked the minister, don't play games with this community anymore. Don't play games with headlines. And will the minister stand together with me today and ensure no matter what the outcome of the budget vote is today, no matter what the outcome is on June 7th, can we stand together and ensure the community will get the project they've been promised? Well, the President of the Treasury Board is warned. Minister. Thank you. Uh, so I think we can understand why the member opposite is so concerned about the future of this project. Uh, what would happen under a Doug Ford government? We know the cuts are coming. He's made it very, very clear. Certainly, this would be a very easy project to, to cancel. Because last October, Mr. Speaker, we actually did approve the planning grant. This project is definitely underway. I appeal to the member, vote for our budget. You'll get your project. Thank you. New question, the member from Windsor, Tecumseh. Thank you, Speaker. My question is for the Premier. Good morning, Premier. Speaker, for more than a month, there's been a strike at Caesars Hotel and Casino in downtown Windsor. Normally, it's a cash cow for the provincial treasury. Millions, millions of dollars have been lost. Money the Liberals planned on using for the promises in their budget. The Auditor General has already served notice there won't be enough money to pay for the promises made, so that's without the loss of the cash from Caesars. Speaker, how can we have any faith in the promises made in the Liberals' aspirational budget? Thank you. Minister of Labour. Minister of Labour. Thank you, Speaker, and thank you to the member for asking a question, a very important question about his community, Speaker. He will know that the members have been on strike there from April 6. At the time of the strike deadline, Speaker, they did reach an agreement, but it wasn't ratified by the membership. And as I always say when I stand up, Speaker, we've got one of the best labour relations records, I, I think, in the Western world, Speaker. 98% of agreements are reached without a strike, without a lockout. So when we see a strike or a lockout occurring, Speaker, we pay particular attention to that. We've got some of the best mediators that are working on this, Speaker. I would urge both sides to come back to the table. We know that the best agreements are those that are reached by the parties at the table, Speaker. We do everything we possibly can to assist in this regard. And, Speaker, by and large, we're very, very, very successful in this province. I think, we can, uh, I think we can achieve a settlement here if both parties come back to the table. Speaker. Thank you. Supplementary. Speaker, for more than a month, 2,300 hotel and casino workers have been walking the picket line. Caesars is the contractor, the manager. The facility is owned by the taxpayers of Ontario. We're losing millions of dollars. Caesars just cancelled all of its shows for the entire month of May. That's intimidation, Speaker. This government has an obligation to the taxpayers as well as the men and women on the picket line, to do more, to work harder, to apply pressure on Caesars to return to the bargaining table and hammer out a settlement. When will this Liberal government show some leadership and make an effort to settle the month-long strike at Caesars? Thank you. Minister. Speaker, thank you again to the member for asking the question. Uh, as, as the other side would like, Speaker, we would like to see a settlement in this. And really, all, all cases around the province, Speaker, where, where, where the sides drift apart, Speaker, they need to be bought back. And especially in this case, it wins the Speaker because people are often drawn into, into a disagreement, into a collective bargaining process, Speaker that are outside of the agreement themselves. And certainly around the Windsor site, there's a lot of small businesses that we know are being impacted uh, by, this, uh, by this strike, people. 
But you know, Speaker, there's a lot of people who go to York University, oh, yes. a lot of students at York University, oh, yes. Speaker, that are being impacted by a strike. Yes. The member and that party over there, Speaker, has had four or five opportunities now to bring that strike to an end. They've turned their back on the students, Speaker. We have a way forward. They should be supporting the students. Yeah. Thank you. Your question, the member from Kingston and the Islands. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. My question is for the Minister of Health and Long-Term Care. It is crucial to our government that Ontario's young and old can access vital prescription drugs without having to bear the financial burden. To do just that, our government made the biggest expansion to Medicare in Ontario in a generation right. through OHIP+. Plus. I know how important this program has been to my constituents in Kingston and the Islands as they no longer have to worry about how they will pay for their children's pres prescriptions. 4,400 drugs, including antibiotics to treat infections, asthma inhalers, insulin, seizure medications, oral contraceptives, antidepressants, drugs to treat arthritis and epilepsy, and more. I know that these investments are much more worth worthwhile than things like paying actors at a rally. Oh. Be seated, please. Be seated, please. Time is up. Minister. Thank you to the member from Kingston and the Islands for this very important question. As a phys physician and a mother, and unfortunately not yet a grandmother, I strongly believe that children in Ontario deserve access to the medications they need to live bright and healthy lives. Since January 1st, over 1.3 million young people aged 24 and under have had their prescriptions filled at no cost under OHIP+. Plus. More than 4.1 million prescriptions have been filled to date under OHIP+. OHIP Plus and the numbers continue to grow. OHIP Plus is benefiting families across the province, but it's also helping organizations that support our most vulnerable populations, such as the Massey Centre, which provides crucial support to pregnant and parenting adolescents. Before OHIP Plus, the Massey Centre covered the medication costs for clients and their young ones who could not afford them. But now, with OHIP Plus, Answer. they are able to put that money to services that help hundreds of young mums, their children, and families in our community. Thank you. Supplementary. Thank you, Minister, for providing this important update and for your continued efforts to improve health care for everyone in this province, <laughs> including the actors, of course. <laughs> OHIP Plus is a historic step taken by our Premier and our government that has not only improved the health and well-being of young people, but it has also helped lift the financial burden off families and is soon to benefit our seniors. In my region alone, over 96,000 children and youth have had their prescriptions filled for free at their local pharmacy, like Drug Smart Pharmacy at Queen's University, Reddendale Pharmacy, and of course, shoppers and Rexall and all of the other small independents. Mr. Speaker, I am proud to be part of a government that helps to fight for our most vulnerable populations. Question. Can the Minister of Health please tell this House the impact that a monumental program such as this will have on the people Thank of you. Ontario and how it will help build You see there, please? You see there, please? Minister. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. And yes, we're not just stopping at young people. We know the costs of some prescription drugs can cause anxiety and stress, especially for people 65 and over who are living on fixed incomes and who are often required to take multiple medications. We all want the best for our parents and grandparents, which is why by August 1st, 2019, we are expanding OHIP Plus to offer free prescription drugs to everyone 
65 and over, no co-payment, no deductible. This expansion will make life more affordable for 2.6 million seniors and their families and will result in prescription drugs being free for one in two Ontarians, wow. bringing us That's that amazing. much closer to the goal of pharmacare for all people in Ontario. That, Mr. Speaker, is how our government is helping to ensure a fair and healthy province. On this side Answer. of the House, we'll continue to fight for our vision of universal pharmacare that will help bring free drug coverage Thank to everyone. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. My question is for the Premier. Premier, your record on seniors and especially long-term care is a source of national shame. After making zero investments in long-term care beds and doubling the wait list, you shamelessly announced 5,000 new beds on the eve of a provincial election. Considering your government had 15 years to build the needed beds but didn't get it done, I want to know, Premier, why should seniors and their families trust you are going to build any new beds after 15 years of inaction? And will you provide a list to me today of how many beds have been allocated for each of the 14 lins across our great province? Thank you. Minister Thank you. Senior Affairs. Minister of Seniors Affairs. Thank you, Speaker. I want to begin by correcting uh, the member opposite. In his question, he suggested that we announce these beds at the eve of an election. That's not true at all, because we actually announced them back in November when we announced 30,000 beds over the yeah. yeah. And we moved fast. Yes, we have moved fast on this file, as we should, and we have made good on the first 5,000, and that's please. exactly what you've been asking us to do. So you can't have it both ways. You can't. Nice and easy. Address the chair, please. So, Speaker, you know, they can't have it both ways. They can't say you're not building fast enough, and then when we start to build fast enough, they say, oh, you're building too fast. Pick a lane. Thank you. A member from Chatham, Kent, Essex. Thank you very much, Speaker. Well, back to the, uh, back to the Premier. Uh, Chatham, Kent, Essex is in dire straits when it comes to doctor shortages. The business model for Chatham Kent Family Health Team was built on a complement of 27 physicians, but now we're down to 22. Two more will be out in August, leaving 3,300 orphaned patients. And Chatham Kent has been identified as an underserviced by your ministry in terms of family physicians. This uh, model, uh, business model is in jeopardy, and the sustainability of the corporation is in doubt. Fixed costs of running the organization do not change, so fewer physicians means higher costs for those doctors who remain. Minister, will you help us in the Chatham-Kent catchment area and assign additional funding for new doctors and nurse practitioners so that the people in my riding of Chatham-Kent-Essex can get the primary care they need? Thank you. Minister of Health and Long-Term Care. Minister of Health and Long-Term Care. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. And, of course, our government is absolutely committed to ensuring that we have an adequate supply of physicians. And so, since 2003, the number of physicians in Ontario has increased by over 30 per cent, which is more than 6,000 additional doctors practicing in our wow. health system today. And during that same time, the population grew by some 11.7 per cent. So that means that through our investment, the ratio of physicians for every 10,000 Ontarians increased from 17.5 to 20.5. This includes over 2,800 family physicians, an increase of some 27.6 per cent, and over 3,700 specialists, an increase of 33.7 per cent. So we have moved forward on a number of initiatives that ensure a stable physician supply, improved retention, and enhance, to enhance the distribution of physicians across Thank Ontario. Thank New question, the member from Timmins, James Bay. And wow! I get the last question of the session. This is cool. Uh, listen, my question is for the uh, Premier. Premier, you'll know as well as I do, all of us in this legislature know you drive up to the pumps and we're being gouged. The price of gas right now is anywhere around $1.40 a litre at a time where the barrel is $70 and it used to be as high as $120, we're paying as much as back then. So clearly the gas companies are gouging the market. There's no way that they can defend $1.40 a litre on the price of the barrel as we see it today. Premier, will you do the right thing and will you adopt our policy, at least into your platform, of regulating the price of gas as Andrew Horvath and the NDP has promised in its platform? Thank you. 
Minister of Energy. Premier, thank you. Minister of Energy. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Uh, pleased to rise and provide uh, the last answer in uh, this session, Mr. Speaker. Um, first off, I want to congratulate you on a, on a fantastic career as Speaker, Mr. Speaker. Thank you so much for all you do. Been warned, Mr. Speaker. Um, with that, warned. Mr. Speaker, I look forward to uh, talking about this issue on the campaign trail, Mr. Speaker, because as he knows, regulation will only make costs go up. On this side of the House, we have a record of bringing things down, Mr. Speaker, just like we did with the Fair Hydro Plan. They have no credibility on that side of the House, Mr. Speaker. We'll continue Answer. to move forward and talk about the issues that matter to people. Thank you. Before we uh, get into a round of, there are some uh, points of orders to be made. Let's try to keep them as short as possible. I will acknowledge them before the vote. So if we could do that quickly, I'd appreciate it before I even recognize you, sir. I do want to say that uh, my lovely daughter, Rachel, is here to, uh, uh, to visit, and uh, I appreciate her presence here. Rachel, thank you for being here. Also, uh, my staff, whom which I could not do very much of anything, uh, Isabel Stavell, and my chief of staff, who has been with me for too many years, if I say so, she'll get mad. Help. Heather is here as well, so thank you for being here. <laughs> uh, I will uh, turn to the uh, Chief Government Whip and the Dean of the House uh, from St. Catharines. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Speaker. I think it would be appropriate for us to pay tribute, as we have, to some who are no longer uh, going to be running in the election to one of the longest serving, the second longest serving member of the Ontario Legislature elected first in uh, 1985, the member for York Centre, now a member for in his 33rd year. He's experienced some health challenges in uh, recent months, but has still managed to represent the people of his riding extremely well. He has had uh, several senior portfolios in government. Uh, even in opposition, Speaker, I should tell you, uh, he still traveled internationally representing the best interests of the province of Ontario. I know we, we all have a great affection for uh, Mr. Marty Quinter. Okay, so let's uh, get this as quickly as possible. The member from Huron, Bruce. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker, and I would just like to extend my appreciation to you, and I'm sure all the MPPs in the House will join me. You have been a remarkable speaker in the sense that you have done so much for this House, and when you represented us at all the different conferences, I know that you were so proud to tell people how we manage this house, this amazing pig palace, Queen's Park, and your legacy is going to be felt for years to come, from the remarkable assembly through to the carrying on of the celebrating the best of the best, be it craft beer or whiskey and things like that. That was a really good initiative that you started. But more importantly, to the, the legacy of remembering and never forgetting. We still have work to do on your behalf, such as the Indigenous panel that will be worked upon, and we will in your spirit, make sure that job gets done. Thank you for all you've done. I believe it was the member from Sarnia Lampton. <clears throat> Thank you, Mr. Speaker. I'd like to introduce two guests of mine here uh, this morning. Uh, I see them in the gallery, Mr. Lauren Given, Sr. and Mr. Lauren Given, Jr., friends of mine from Petroya and from the great riding of Sarnia Lampton. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. I would like to thank you for everything you've done for Francophonie in Parliament. I had the privilege to travel with you with the Francophonie Association, and I always appreciated the efforts, uh, your efforts, 
and uh, on behalf of Andrea Horvath and the NDP caucus, uh, thank you for all the hard work. It's not easy, uh, but you manage really well. Merci beaucoup. Merci beaucoup. Thank you. Mr. Finance. Mr. Speaker, we're all blessed to have extraordinary staff who work for all of us, who enable us to do well. And Mr. Speaker, with your indulgence, I'd like to welcome to the legislature my legislative ass assistant, Sophia Kokolas, to the gallery. She's here with her friend, Jason Rhino, and I want to thank her for her contributions to the budget bill, to the contributions that she made on Finance Committee. She's done an exceptional job, as, so, as many do for all of us. So congratulations to all of our staff. Thank you. The, uh, the Minister of uh, Senior Affairs. Uh, thank you, Speaker. I'd like to take the opportunity to thank all of the members here for their service to Ontarians and also recognize a very important group that has come here from my riding. It's SAV Canada, Syrian Active Volunteer Canada. It's a non governmental organization and it has helped support Syrian refugees with their arrival into Canada. And, I want to welcome Sam Jisri, Sana Mumani, Amjad Nasri, Ragbad Idilbi, Faris Ali Akbar, Munzer Wafai, Ashraf Alared, Gainat Aluski, Nagam Aluski, Dana Aluski, Hiba Jaber, Kusay Al Rafai, Raiden Gargas, Maher Hamud, Zakaria Aldahar, Ahmed Aldahar, Muhammad Al Sadi. Baha Aldin Al Sadi, Zainab Al Astarbadi, Yazan Akkar, welcome. Thank you. I recognize Tyler Freeman. I just noticed him. He works in my office. Welcome, Tyler. Thank you, Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. I'd, I'd like to. Uh, recognize a very special friend, Jasper Grewal. Uh, we came to Canada about the same time and we shared many things Canadian for the first time. And, um, and I'm so proud of him and he stood with me um, along this journey every step of the way. So I'd like to welcome you to the session. I'll give you a session uh, Thank you very much, Speaker. I have a second school here today. Uh, welcome the students from the Church of God in Elmer. Welcome. Good, welcome. Uh, thank you, Speaker. I want to personally thank you for never having recognized any of my outbursts in six and a half years. <laughs> yeah, yeah, you guessed it. The member's warned. <laughs> the, the member from Kitchener, Conestoga. I'd like to welcome and thank my constituency staff, Megan Martin, Aaron Flynn, of course, those from home, David Kuhn and Norma Lock. Thank you so much. Thank you. Windsor, the country. Thank you, Speaker. I'm probably out of order, but I, on a point of order, I would like to ask for unanimous consent to allow you to say goodbye. Shall I, sh shall I, shall I uh, get in front of that by saying I'm already going to do that? <laughs> Minister of Infrastructure. Speaker, can you make a ruling on whether it's appropriate for you to be showing your colors today by wearing red running shoes? It's the only pair I own. I, I, I would have worn yellow if I had it, if I had them. Minister of Education. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. I just want to welcome uh, some people who inspire me in my work every day, and that is my family. So here with us today is my father, Larry Naidu, my husband, Randy Harris, our daughter, Oriana Harris, our son, Galen Harris, and our uh, soon-to-be daughter-in-law, Brenna Milligan, who's sitting at the back. Welcome to Queen's Park. Thank you. Welcome. I just want to make a note that the member from Timmins, James Bay, just got his phone taken. <laughs> I do have one quick announcement, and it's a very sad one. The bearer of sad news is that this is our page's last day. The last set of pages in the 41st Parliament. Wow. That's it. No more. We want to thank them for their wonderful efforts. That they've done in we thank them very much.
And now we do have a deferred vote on the motion of third reading of Bill 53, an act respecting the establishment of minimum government contract wages. Calling the members, this will be a five minute bill.
members, please take your seats. Please take your seats. Thank you. Social butterfly. On May 7, 2018, Mr. Flynn moved third reading of Bill 53, an act respecting the establishment of minimum government contract wages. All those in favor, please rise. One at a time, be recognized by the clerk. Mr. Flynn. Mr. Flynn. Mr. Knack. Mr. Knack. Mr. Bradley. Mr. Bradley. Mr. Del Duca. Mr. Del Duca. Mr. McMahon. Mr. McMahon. Mr. Susan. Mr. Susan. Ms. Wynn. Ms. Wynn. Ms. Naidu Harris. Ms. Naidu Harris. Ms. Jassy. Ms. Jassy. Mr. Shirelli. Mr. Shirelli. Mr. Chan. Mr. Chan. Ms. McCharles. Ms. McCharles. Mr. McMeekin. Mr. McMeekin. Mr. Takar. Mr. Takar. Mr. Quinter. Mr. Quinter. Mr. Dugan. Mr. Dugan. Mr. Sandals. Mr. Sandals. Ms. Matthews. Ms. Matthews. Mr. Gravel. Mr. Gravel. Mr. Ballard. Mr. Ballard. Madame Lalonde. Madame Lalonde. Mr. Moridi. Mr. Moridi. Ms. Hunter. Ms. Hunter. Mr. Coteau. Mr. Coteau. Mr. Leo. Mr. Leo. Mr. Tebow. Mr. Tebow. Mrs. Albanese. Mrs. Albanese. Mr. Rinaldi. Mr. Rinaldi. Mr. Cole. Mr. Cole. Mr. Bardinetti. Mr. Bardinetti. Mr. Delaney. Mr. Delaney. Mr. Dillon. Mr. Dillon. Ms. Domerlin. Ms. Domerlin. Ms. Vernil. Ms. Vernil. Mr. Milch. Mr. Milch. Mr. Zimmer. Mr. Zimmer. Mrs. McGarry. Mrs. McGarry. Mr. Morrow. Mr. Morrow. Ms. Molly. Ms. Molly. Madame de Rosie. Madame de Rosie. Mr. Codrey. Mr. Codrey. Mr. Dixon. Mr. Dixon. Mrs. Mangas. Mr. Manga. Mr. Crack. Mr. Crack. Ms. Wong. Ms. Wong. Mr. Fraser. Mr. Fraser. Mr. Anderson. Mr. Anderson. Mr. Baker. Mr. Baker. Mr. Dong. Mr. Dong. Ms. Hogarth. Ms. Hogarth. Ms. Koala. Ms. Koala. Mrs. Martin. Mrs. Martin. Mr. Yakabuski. Mr. Arna. Mr. Arna. Mr. Hardiman. Mr. Hardiman. Ms. Jones. Ms. Jones. Mr. Fidelli. Mr. Fidelli. Mr. Smith. Mr. Smith. Mr. McNaught. Mr. McNaught. Ms. Scott. Ms. Scott. Ms. Thompson. Ms. Thompson. Mrs. Marteau. Mrs. Marteau. Mr. Urich. Mr. Urich. Mr. Walker. Mr. Walker. Mr. Walker. Mr. Bailey. Mr. Bailey. Mr. Romano. Mr. Romano. Mr. Nichols. Mr. Nichols. Mrs. Monroe. Mrs. Monroe. Mr. McDonnell. Mr. McDonnell. Mr. Pettipe. Mr. Pettipe. Mr. Coe. Mr. Coe. Mr. Cho. Mr. Cho. Ms. Forrester. Ms. Forrester. Ms. Should be song. Should be song. Ms. Horvath. Ms. Horvath. Madame Jelen. Madame Jelen. Mr. Tabbins. Mr. Tabbins. Mr. Hatfield. Mr. Hatfield. Mr. Harris. Mr. Harris. All those opposed, please rise one at a time and be recognized by the clerk. The ayes are 79, the nays are zero. The ayes being 79, the nays being zero, I declare the motion carried. Lecture du projet de loi. Be resolved that the bill do now pass and be entitled as in the motion. We have a deferred vote on the motion of third reading of Bill 31, an act to implement budget measures and to act and amend various statutes. Just a minute, let me finish my script. Call on the members, this will be a five minute bell. Same vote. On May 7, 2018, Mr. Sousa moved third reading of Bill 31, an act to implement budget measures and to enact and amend various statutes. All those in favour, please rise one at a time be recognized by the clerk. Mr. Sousa, Mr. Matthews, Mr. Bradley, Mr. Del Duca, Ms. McMahon, Ms. Wynn, Ms. Naidu Harris, Ms. Naidu Harris, Ms. Jassy, Ms. Jassy, Mr. Shirelli, Mr. Shirelli, Mr. Chan, Mr. Chan, Ms. McCharles, Ms. McCharles, Mr. McMeekin, Mr. McMeekin, Mr. Takar, Mr. Takar. Mr. Quinter. Mr. Quinter. Mr. Dugan. Mr. Dugan. Mrs. Sandals. Mrs. Sandals. Ms. Matthews. Ms. Matthews. Mr. Gravel. Mr. Gravel. Mr. Ballard. Mr. Ballard. Madame Lalonde. Madame Lalonde. Mr. Moridi. Mr. Moridi. Ms. Hunter. Mr. Hunt Mr. Hunter. Mr. Coteau. 
Mr. Leo. Mr. Leo. Mr. Flynn. Mr. Flynn. Mr. Tebow. Mr. Tebow. Mr. Albanese. Mr. Albanese. Mr. Rinaldi. Mr. Rinaldi. Mr. Cole. Mr. Cole. Mr. Bardinetti. Mr. Bardinetti. Mr. Delaney. Mr. Delaney. Mr. Dillon. Mr. Dillon. Mr. Darmer. Mr. Darmer. Mr. Verniel. Mr. Verniel. Mr. Milch. Mr. Milch. Mr. Zimmer. Mr. Zimmer. Mr. McGarry. Mr. McGarry. Mr. Morrow. Mr. Morrow. Ms. Molly. Ms. Molly. Madame De Rosier. Madame De Rosier. Mr. Codry. Mr. Codry. Mr. Dixon. Mr. Dixon. Mrs. Manga. Mrs. Manga. Mr. Crack. Mr. Crack. Ms. Wong. Ms. Wong. Mr. Fraser. Mr. Fraser. Mr. Anderson. Mr. Anderson. Mr. Baker. Mr. Baker. Mr. Dong. Mr. Dong. Ms. Hogar. Ms. Hogar. Ms. Koala. Ms. Koala. Mrs. Martin. Mrs. Martin. Mr. Potts. Mr. Potts. All those opposed, please rise. One at a time, be recognized by the clerk. Mr. Fidelli. Fidelli. Mr. Arnold. Mr. Arnold. Mr. Hardiman. Mr. Hardiman. Mr. Jones. Mr. Jones. Mr. Smith. Mr. Smith. Mr. Yakubuski. Mr. Yakubuski. Mr. Miller Perry Sound Muskoka. Mr. Miller Perry Sound Muskoka. Mr. McNaught. Mr. McNaught. Ms. Scott. Ms. Scott. Ms. Thompson. Ms. Thompson. Mrs. Marteau. Mrs. Marteau. Mr. Urick. Mr. Urick. Mr. Walker. Mr. Walker. Mr. Bailey. Mr. Bailey. Mr. Romano. Mr. Romano. Mr. Nichols. Mr. Nichols. Mrs. Monroe. Mrs. Monroe. Mr. McDonnell. Mr. McDonnell. Mr. Pettipees. Mr. Pettipees. Mr. Coe. Mr. Coe. Mr. Cho. Mr. Cho. Ms. Horvath. Ms. Horvath. Mr. Should be Song. Should be Song. Madame Jelena. Madame Jelena. Mr. Tabbins. Mr. Tabbins. Ms. Forrester. Ms. Forrester. Mr. Hatfield. Mr. Hatfield. Mr. Harris. Mr. Harris. The eyes are 53, the nays are 28. The eyes being 53, the nays being 28, I declare the motion carried. We're reading the bill, troisième lecture du projet de loi. Be resolved that the bill do not pass and be entitled as in the motion. Government House Leader on a point of order. Well, Mr. Speaker, I mean Speaker, her mm -hmm. owner awaits.
Pray be seated. May it please your honour. The Legislative Assembly of the Province of Ontario has at its present meetings thereof passed certain bills to which, in the name and on behalf of the said Legislative Assembly, I respectfully request your honour's assent. The following are the title of the bills to which your honour's assent is prayed. An act to implement budget measures and to enact and amend various statutes. Loi visant à mettre en œuvre les mesures budgétaires et à édicter et à modifier diverses lois. An act respecting the establishment of minimum government contract wages. Loi concernant la fixation de salaire minimum pour les marchés publics. In Her Majesty's name, Her Honour the Lieutenant Governor doth assent to these bills. Au nom de Sa Majesté, Son Honour, la Lieutenant Gouverneur sanctionne ces projets de loi. Mr. Speaker, members of the Legislative Assembly, as the people of Toronto continue to display resilience following the tragic events on the streets of our city mere days ago, I wish to recognize Police Chief Mark Saunders, Deputy Fire Chief Tony Bavota, and Acting Paramedic Chief Gord McKechn, who are accompanying me here today. And as well, Juliana Carboni, Toronto City Manager and Head of the Toronto Public Service, Michael Killingsworth, Head of Transit Enforcement at the Toronto Transit Commission, who are in the gallery. These civic leaders guide well over 50,000 first responders and devoted civil servants working every day to ensure our safety and well-being and the good functioning of this great city. Their professionalism and skill, so ably demonstrated on good days and bad, are an example to us all. I also wish to put on record my appreciation to all of you for your service in Parliament, which I know takes you away from your families and loved ones. Your dedication to your constituents and to the people of Ontario is worthy of the highest commendation. Were it not for your efforts, our democracy would be greatly diminished. As the representative of Her Majesty the Queen, au nom de Lorraine, I offer you my profound gratitude on behalf of the people of Ontario for your exemplary service and sense of purpose. I pray you offer me a short moment. This is amazing. This is amazing. This place, what we do, how we serve. I need to thank you personally for this wonderful opportunity in my life that I will never forget. You know 
that this is a beacon to the world. Democracy, but indeed this house. More importantly, the people in it. Let me offer my deepest gratitude, and I'm sure you share this with me, to the staff of the legislature. They work tirelessly behind the scenes usually, sometimes in front of the scenes, but usually not purposefully, to make this place work and run like a clock. So to the staff, the clerk's office, the security, to all of the people who work in this building and the precinct, I offer my humble thanks for a job well done. And by extension, to each and every one of your staffs, past, present, and some of you in the future, they are the backbone of what you are trying to do in the service of the people you serve, and to and that extension to the people of Ontario. The staff that help us day in and day out, sometimes cover for us, sometimes taking the brunt and the heat of the passion of the members and the people of Ontario, to your staffs, to my staff, thank you for the job well done and continue to do that great work that you do. So thank you. <laughs> to those that would uh, keep our feet to the fire, please, the only thing I implore is that you do it with dignity and grace and with a little class. If you're hurting, your passion can get away from you and that you use various means of communication to be hurtful. I know something has gone wrong, that you feel that way, and I know that in your heart of hearts, you recognize that the people before me are simply trying to do their job, maybe the way they think, but not maybe the way you think. I offer you peace, please, in your heart of hearts. Recognize that we don't need to go down. We need to all keep our feet to the fire, but do it in a way that is kind. That can be done. Finally, on a personal note to each and every one of you, I now consider you my family, and if that's the case, my house for beers. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> I personally have to tell you that uh, two full careers for me, one in education that I was passionate about and one in politics that I was passionate about, I never lost sight of the fact that our family sacrificed. Each and one, every, every one of us, in one way or another, sacrificed something for your family. So to my family, I want to offer them my undying love and gratitude. They've allowed me to do the things that I've wanted to do and I prayed to do. So to them, all I'm saying is, Dad's coming home. <laughs> I am going to have one gesture, gesture before I leave, but I have to make this official proclamation. Once I make the proclamation, I will leave you with my eyes, my ears, my nose, my heart, and to make sure that I watch over you all the time and give you a reminder. Just remember what I said. I have received a proclamation that provides for the dissolution of the current 41st Parliament at 2 p.m. this afternoon. As a result, the Legislature will not be meeting today, again today, and therefore, this House is accordingly adjourned.